I never thought about growing old. It just suddenly, I woke up and I was 80. And it was amazing. Anne McGovern is amazing. She wears a positive attitude like a badge. She defies all cliches. Okay, so not, you'll be here the rest of the time, but not on Tuesdays. Not on Tuesdays. 83, <laughs> yes. Slow down, no. Annie and her assistant work in their office most days to keep the Anne McGovern brand alive. Stone Soup is probably my best known book. You may have read Stone Soup or one of the 55 other children's books by Anne McGovern. They sold 30 million copies, but that was yesterday. I feel excited about things still, and I, I feel there's so much to do and so much to create. These are faces that I've taken from pictures I found in magazines. And then I began doing my friends. Here's my daughter-in-law. She's an artist and a poet. And wish I were a giant, so I can stand on giant tiptoes to touch. They look so cold, the stars. I want to warm them with my hands. She also delights in other writers' work. Children's books are the best books in the whole world. And clearly loves to see moms and kids reading her books. Oh, the cow said, moo moo. The bed creaked, the floor squeaked. The She's also happy to talk with longtime fans. Annie's philosophy is simple. Live to the brim of what you can, of how you can. And don't dwell on the negative. But there is the negative. Doctors at Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York keep close watch on her health. Two years ago, she battled breast cancer, and last year, doctors discovered two brain tumors. I had an intense radiation uh, procedure where they radiated the two of them for 40 minutes, and they made a mask, and I bolted to the table, and apparently that worked. Annie learned early to live life her own way. My mother went sort of nuts after my father died when I was five. And uh, I think my sister and I raised ourselves. My mother was a health nut. She believed that if you drank your orange juice and your milk together, it would be better for you. And that almost made me throw up. So she would get hysterically furious and take the whole wheat muffin with the butter and grind it in my hair. And that's how I went to school. At six, she developed a stutter and took refuge in books. And I spent every minute when I wasn't in school in the library and reading. Reading fueled her imagination. I hated my home life, but I looked forward to going to bed because I fantasized my bed as a caravan. I even hanging pots, and, in my mind, hanging pots and pans from the bedpost. And in the caravan were books and chocolate and everything I loved. And it was. They were driven by two white horses, and we went everywhere. We went over mountains, we saw castles, we went across deserts, we went palm trees, all the things I've read about. Annie drifted away from home when she was 14 after her older sister moved out. I was always adopting friends' parents. In fact, there was one friend I called her parents' mama and papa, and they were very good to me. That's where I spent Christmas and Thanksgiving and birthdays. Then at 18, she headed west for college in New Mexico. Went to the University of New Mexico, and I loved it, but I loved a teacher more, and he was totally inappropriate. But I fell into obsession, and I married him. I was 18, and had a baby, I was barely 20, and uh, left when I was 21. Back in New York, she took a series of low-paying jobs, including a clerical job at the publisher Golden Books. In the ladies' room, she overheard someone say they wanted a book about the TV cowboy Roy Rogers. I picked up a comic book about Roy Rogers on the way home. I stayed up all night, and I wrote this terrible, terrible <laughs> script. And the next day, I found her. The company was very small at the time. And I said, I I is th this what you want. And she looked at me and she looked at the manuscript. It took her three minutes to scan it. She said, it's not good, but it's not bad. <laughs> so they changed three words and they published it. And then they made me an, an editor. 
and I was supposed to know of all about grammar and how to fix sentences. I knew nothing. But I shared an office with a very generous man, and he helped me. She earned $46 a week and wasn't paid for the children's book she wrote. It was tough. My son Peter was little, and we could not afford to have a steak. I used to make hamburgers, mostly breadcrumbs. But I saved up enough money to have a steak. So they were on the kitchen counter in this walk-up, and the ceiling fell down. The plaster came down right on those steaks. And Peter and I, he was about eight, we cried together. <laughs> that next year, he was said, because I'm so interested in art, he had a wonderful birthday present for me. He kept talking about me and art. And my birthday came, and he handed me this badly wrapped package, and I could see it was a paperback book. Of course, I opened it thinking it was going to be about art. A hundred ways to cook hamburgers. <laughs> so to earn more, she took a job at Scholastic and continued to write for Golden Books. And they did pay me $250 each Golden Book. No rights, no royalties. And then I discovered there were better books out there. She started to write better books, and one stands out for her. Wanted Dead or Alive, the story of Harriet Tubman, is one of my favorites. Uh, it's a biography of the bravest w woman I know. She fought for her freedom, she ran away, and then she came back to free other slaves. She freed about 300 slaves. Annie's life changed in a different way when she met her second husband, Marty. I stopped stuttering because he believed in me. I think it was the first time someone really and truly believed in me. She gained three children and began a life filled with travel. We went to Morocco on our wedding trip. It was wonderful. It was like my fairy tale books and my caravan. It was just amazing. Everything new and everything. Different cultures, different sounds, different smells. And that has been the way I feel about travel today. Her new family lured her into adventure. We all wanted to do something we could do together. And the kids said, let's try scuba diving. And I said, let's not. <laughs> My religion is devout coward. Finally, they convinced her to try. And they lowered me down about 40 feet. I think I even had my eyes closed when I opened it. It was heaven. I thought I died and went to heaven. It was just so amazing. And you have a feeling of weightlessness, because underwater, you don't feel the 50-pound tank. And you can do a somersault, stand on your head. And my life changed then. Whenever I think of my mortality, I think a wonderful way to end my life would be with the fish and the coral and the weightlessness. A near-death experience in the Red Sea gave her insight. We were, had such a wonderful time. We looked at a vertical shipwreck. And we were diving and diving and seeing and seeing. And we looked at our air gauge, and we were very low on air. So we came up, and there was no boat. Nobody had told us where the boat would be. And the waves kept over my head and over my head. And then a current came and separated us. And I said, I love you, Marty. He said, save your breath. That was his way of saying, I love you. So I thought I was going to die. And I almost did. I didn't see the pearly stuff you're supposed to see in the sky, but I felt a grayish lovely color, and I felt warm, and I felt peaceful, and I felt bliss, pure bliss. Marty made it back to the island, Lighthouse Island, and my head made it back there. The rest of me was swirling around the waters when they found me. Back home, trying to understand the experience, she visited a psychic healer. So I went to Carmen de Barazzo. I still remember her name. Uh, and she said, I can't help you because you died and chose life. And fast forward 20 years, and Marty's in the hospital dying. And when I heard his breathing change, I don't know what made me do it, but I began to talk him into a scuba dive. And I described all the fish on the top, the colorful fish. And then we went down, and I 
described the bigger fish and the sharks, and I told him his video camera was working. And then I said, at a, we're at 125 feet now, and I, have, I can't go with you anymore. You have to go alone. And he died with the same bliss on his face that I had felt in the Red Sea. So I was so happy to, have, to, to give him a good death, to help him die. And since then, I've had no fear of death at all. But losing Marty was a blow. I didn't think I could do anything. I didn't think I could live. I didn't think I could do it. I didn't think I could go on. But I did. I did. As the years went by, she discovered a new friend. I met my companion, my part-time companion. <laughs> I call him my old geezer. He's going to be 87 in three days. Uh, I met him on Match.com. <laughs> Ralph Greenberg is a regular at family events. And that's another thing about her. Annie makes sure the family, which is scattered from the Caribbean to Oregon to East Timor, gathers regularly to celebrate each other. If you can beat the tragedy and the traumas and the bad events, and you can make it something that makes you stronger, that's, I guess that's what I've done.